Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, we seem to have things fixed. I gather that there's quite a number of people already watching, watching the live stream. We've got that link fixed, so that's, that's great. Um, my name is Evan Weitzman. I'm the chair of the Department of Conflict Resolution, Human Security, and Global Governance, and director of the graduate programs in conflict resolution here at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Um, I want to say welcome to our to you all to our annual Sylvia and Benjamin Slomoff Lecture in Conflict Resolution. We're extremely honored to be joined today by Christiana Figueres, who is the Executive Secretary of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, and who in that role is charged with leading the United Nations' global efforts to confront climate change and to negotiate worldwide cooperation on those efforts. We're also joined by a number of important members of our own community here, we have Dean Ira Jackson of the McCormick Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies, who will be making a few remarks at the end of the event this afternoon. Um, we're joined by our provost, Winston Langley, who will speak in a few moments. I want to say a little bit, just as we get started, about the sponsor of this event. Um, ben Slomoff, um, who, if, if the stars are properly aligned, is now watching this live uh, via live streaming from his home in California. Ben is one of the most inspiring people I've ever met. After high school, Ben went to work selling shoes. He left the shoe business to serve in the armed forces in World War II. And after a somewhat extended career in the armed forces, I think it was about 14 years, he then went back to work selling shoes. He wound up owning a successful shoe company, which he ran for many years. He wound up owning a couple of different shoe factories. After retirement, he came to UMass Boston for his bachelor's degree. And then in his 80s, he came and did a certificate in conflict resolution with us. After that, he came back and did a master's in conflict resolution with us. And this past November, Ben turned 99. He now mediates and arbitrates several days a week. He currently has several multi-million dollar cases on his docket. And in 2002, he published a book of his own poetry. Each year since 1999, with Ben's generous support, we've held the Slomoff Lectureship. This has been one of our most exciting events each year. The Slomoff Lectureship has brought us some of the most well-known and influential people in our field including Mort Deutsch, Herb Kelman, and Barbara Bunker, all social psychologists, Dennis Ross, shortly after he left the State Department the first time, Eric Green, who spoke about mediating the Microsoft antitrust case, John Marks of Search for Common Ground, the mediator and author Bernie Mayer, Professor Richard Hackman, one of the world's leading experts on teams, and last year, Senator George Mitchell. Ben was not able to be with us in person this year, but he's watching the stream live, as I said, from California. And we're joined here today by Ben's grandson, Brian Green, and close family friend, Nancy Sonnabend. So thank you for coming and representing the Slomoff family and legacy. I want to say a few, moment, a few words about the topic that we're talking about here today, just a few. And then I will turn this over to our provost, Winston Langley, to introduce the speaker today. Here's one frame for thinking about the challenges of climate change. And the frame goes like this. We have a great many needs and wants that are met by things that are bad for others. Heating, air conditioning, the vast array of energy consuming things that we find helpful, indispensable, or just enjoyable uh, to use. We're confronted with all sorts of problems when using too much of these things winds up being bad for the commons, for, for us all as a group. Who's going to use how much? And with what respect for the commons and the common good? Will the powerful consent to be governed or use less than they are able to grab if they choose to try to grab it? What happens when values collide? Do you revere forests for their own sake? Uh, and if so, what value do you place on that? Or do you care about forests only insofar as they contribute in necessary ways to the atmosphere or the climate? The stakes are enormous. In fact, they couldn't be larger. Will we be able to continue to survive on this planet? And do you even believe that that's a real question? This mix of competing needs, disagreements about the facts, and deep-seated differences in values 
make the problem of solving climate change what is known as a wicked problem. Wicked problems, as I learned from my student Vanessa DiCarlo a couple of years ago, are social dilemmas that defy resolution because of the enormous interdependencies, uncertainties, circularities, and conflicting stakeholders implicated by any effort to develop a solution. Climate change is often seen in this way. But our speaker, Christiana Figueres, has been suggesting that maybe that's the wrong narrative to be engaging in entirely. And that's often a fundamentally important approach to dealing with conflict. Don't just try to sort out the different needs, but can you change the narrative? Can you change the conversation you're having? So in that context, Christiana Figueres is given the job of shepherding negotiations on this problem on a global scale. No easy task. I want to welcome to introduce our speaker, our provost, Winston Langley. Winston has been a great champion and supporter of our programs and our department going back to our founding. He has constantly inspired us, encouraged us, counseled us, and supported our efforts. And he always challenges us to think a little harder and a little more clearly. So I've asked him to say a few words and to introduce our speaker. Please join me in welcoming Provost Winston Langley. I think this lectureship, and good afternoon, this lectureship has indicated before, is named in honor of Ben Slomov and is a distinguished alumnus of the program. And now it has become part of a larger uh, aggregate within the university, the Department of Conflict Resolution global governance and human security. It is rather fitting, I think, that this be so given the topic that will be the focus of the lecture, one dealing with climate change. Can there be an area of human and societal concern that is more likely to be productive of conflict, human insecurity, and the need for global governance? Climate change has no respect for national, cultural, geographic borders. Its reach is global. If the challenge and the reach happens to be global in scope, then it means we must find solutions that are at least as coextensive as the challenge itself. That means all of us, everywhere, are implicated. Responding to climate change in terms of global governance and human security is more easily said than done, however. Putting into practice what we know must be done is very often very difficult, given the complexity of perceptions, preferences, interests, prejudices, the social standing of victims and beneficiaries, if we can really speak of beneficiaries, especially in the intermediate term, certainly not the long term, the cultural orientation of certain human groupings, the asymmetry of existing power relations, they all conspire against any easy solution. It takes leaders with special gifts and skills, intellectual and moral commitments, in temperaments, in practiced patience, in cultural complexities. Leaders who are deeply appreciative of the pitfalls of political terrains and historical memories. Fortunately for us, we have someone with us today who is among the type of person the world needs. She took a top job in the world dealing with climate change in 2010 
after having ably served as negotiator for Costa Rican for Costa Rica and as leader of the environmental NGO dedicated to climate change. She enjoys respect among negotiators from the global north and from the global south. She's a public intellectual in her own right and a deft navigator across minefields of global politics. She's also from a family who is no stranger to Boston. A family whose values have been in the forefront of expanding the space of public goods. Her father, Jose Figueres Ferrer, was a three-time president of Costa Rica and a social democrat when social democracy meant what it symbolized broad social and economic commitments on behalf of all, especially those who are least socially favored. He studied at MIT, was a visiting professor at Harvard, and was a strong supporter of President Kennedy's efforts in the Alliance for Progress. Her brother, Jose Maria Figueres, served as president of Costa Rica from 1944 to 1998 and created a comprehensive national sustainable development strategy. He too called Boston home <coughs> for a time when he was a student at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. I think he did not know that we are here. <laughs> Her sister, Muni Figueres, currently serves as ambassador of Costa Rica to the United States. She embodies the ideals that we associate with the global leader we said, one who can understand the concerns of many constituencies, integrate them as part of one's own, and can work with governments of every conceivable orientation to find some common ground and to present and represent it in the context of our common and joint agenda for current and future generations. She is, of course, in Costa Rica an inspiration there, but she's also an inspiration elsewhere and is often seen the conflicting objectives that tamper with the people of the Earth, its planet, and our well-being. The University of Massachusetts, Boston, which seeks to achieve some of the objectives she shares through its focus on inclusion, on the integrity of the environment, on the integrity of our country, the planet, on the cross-section of the world in its student body and on telling the story of an individual past for humans and for nature, but also a common past. It is within that context that we recognize and warmly welcome Christina Figueres to our campus. Well, thank you, Provost, for that very, very, uh, very warm welcome. Uh, and since, um, thanks to you, I have not walked in here on my own, but with my entire wonderful family. Um, let me actually start by expressing my deep felt sentiments to the families of those who were so profoundly touched by the tragedy of last week in Boston. I'm sure you know that there are millions of people around the world who are feeling with those families 
who are feeling with this university and who are feeling with this city. And in that context, I salute Boston Strong. I would also like to uh, start by thanking um, the one and only Ben Slomov. Honestly, don't we all want to be him when we finally grow up? Uh, I really uh, thank Ben for his, uh, for his vision in creating this. Um, he is uh, unfortunately not able to be here today with us, uh, but he is, as, uh, as has been announced, so ably represented by Brian and Nancy. Thank you for coming today, and thank you, Ben, if you're listening, uh, for, for having created this lecture series uh, and for giving me the opportunity to, in your footsteps uh, of dedication to climate resolution, to share with you today some thoughts on um, climate resolution and, uh, and climate action. Um, you know, my friends, as you can imagine, meeting the climate change challenge is an unprecedented task. Uh, the UN Secretary General has called it the greatest challenge that humanity has ever faced, and I think that is no exaggeration because it really demands uh, a collective and coherent approach on the international, national, and uh, private sector levels. So, Many just decide and conclude, you know what, this is too complex. It is too late. It is too expensive. It is too controversial. It's just not going to be resolved. And I certainly do not minimize or underestimate either the complexity or the challenge. But because that is actually my day job, so we can talk about my day job um, <laughs> during the, uh, during the uh, Q&A part. But today, I would like to share with you um, a different view of the climate challenge, which is that actually the international effort, the national efforts, and the private sector efforts are already proving that climate action can help to resolve conflicts, and in fact, can avoid conflicts that are greater than any of us have ever seen. So let me start there, because um, it is very clear that the failure to address climate in a timely fashion would be the greatest conflict uh, that, uh, that we can possibly imagine. And how would we go down that dangerous path? Well, it's actually rather easy. We just stay on the course that we are right now. Everything that we're doing right now, or everything just counted as business as usual, uh, would be the equivalent of seeding increased conflict around the world. Climate change is already, there are changing weather patterns that are changing the geographies of the planet. Some areas, are becoming deserts, other areas are being lost to the sea. The International Organization on Migration is already hard at work studying the migration patterns that would come out of the, uh, the non-addressing of climate change, and they conclude that we would be walking into uh, climate, into conflicts, often violent, around the access to food, water, and land around the world. The U.S. military has already called climate change one of the greatest threats to the U.S. national security. It will not surprise you that the U.N. Security Council is looking at the climate change implications for global security. And it's not just our future security that would be threatened. It is actually many of the advances that we have had over the past 20 to 25 years. The United Nations Development Program uh, just published 
its 2013 Human Development Report. And if you haven't had a chance to read it, let me uh, entice you by sharing with you that contrary to what you might believe, it actually is full of positive news because it actually gives us the data on the rise in living standards in developing countries. In China alone, 500 million people have been lifted out of poverty. And in fact, the Millennium Development Goal that had to do with, par uh, with poverty is actually being reached on time. So that's actually very good news for those of us in one way or another um, involved in, uh, in development and particularly in developing countries. However, the same report points out that if we do not successfully address climate change, that it will actually catapult into extreme poverty five billion people by the year 2050. So in my book, we don't have any other option but to resolve climate. In shorthand, there is no plan B because there is no planet B. This is our planet and we are going to solve this problem. So, <laughs> so let me move now into having warned us all of what we're not gonna do. Let us move into what we are actually doing. Uh, because actually I think it's a much more enticing topic. Let me share with you three areas of conflict, and here, it, Ben, I ask for your pardon on how I'm going to de de define conflict resolution. I'm going to take sort of a very generous uh, uh, meaning to conflict re resolution. But let me share with you three conflicts that I believe either have been resolved or are in the process of being resolved in the context of climate change. The first, this being thankfully an academic institution. The first conflict that has been resolved is the conflict of the belief in science. I was educated in this country. I still believe in science. You all still believe in science, right? Well, globally, globally, here is very interesting data. Between January of 1991 and November of 2012, there were 13,950 articles, books, da 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 da, published, peer reviewed. 13,950. Out of those, 24, with no zeros behind that, 24 were the articles that actually questioned the science or said it has something to do with. No, not, not, it has something to do not with, uh, with uh, CO2 emissions. So 24 out of 13,950 is actually 0.17%, one-fifth of 1%. One so climate deniers are really walking a very, very, very thin tightrope out there. And if you don't want to look at all of these articles, well, all you have to do is open your eyes and see what's happening around you. In 2012, the ice cover of the Arctic was reduced by 186,000 square miles. That is 17 times the size of the state of Massachusetts. The last 30 years have been the warmest on record <coughs> over land masses in the past 1,400 years. The year 2012, was the warmest year on record in the United States. And I don't have to remind you of the droughts of last year in the Southwest, and I certainly do not have to remind you about Sandy, the second costliest disaster, natural disaster here in the United States. And to bring it a little bit closer to home, did you know that the Boston Harbor Association uh, actually figured out that had Sandy hit 
five and a half hours earlier, i.e. during high tide, my dear friends, that would have been in Boston, a flood normally associated with a frequency of only once every 100 years. Did you know that the Boston Harbor Association has actually the two scenarios of sea level rise? And you're not looking at the sea, but I am. Uh, so that beautiful sea that we have right out there, scenarios for sea level rise. One scenario is five feet. Under that scenario, we would have what we normally conceive as 100 year coastal flooding, we would have it two times a day, every day in Boston, every day in Boston. And under a 7.5 feet scenario, this fantastic campus would no longer be a peninsula, it would be an island. Not on high tide, a permanent island. So my dear friends, I'm not into fear mongering, but it is very important to know what it is that we have to avoid. This future that I have painted for you is not the future that we're going to have. It is the future that we must and will avoid. But we have to have very clear what the price is. And the United States and all other countries around the world have now been subjected to some kind of climate change um, impact and basically have reached the conclusion climate change is occurring, it is here, and we do have to do something about it. So in my book, the belief about the science of climate change is resolved. That conflict is no longer with us. Let us take it as a given and march up to the solutions. The second conflict that I want to address is the conflict of fuels. And let me start there with the very evident that actually over the past 100 years, we have been happily using up the hydrocarbons of the world. Um, and we still use primarily hydrocarbon fuels. We will continue to use some hydrocarbons. Even under the scenario of the best, most effective, most successful answer to climate change, we will still continue to use some hydrocarbons in our global energy mix. But the growth in energy represented by the increased demand in energy by more population and more ably productive population coming in the future, that growth needs to come primarily from renewable energies because of our planetary boundaries. Now, I'll have you know that this is actually not a revolutionary idea. It is not a new idea. And may I quote, I quote, we should be using nature's inexhaustible sources of energy, sun, wind, and tide. I'd put my money on the sun and solar energy. What a source of power. I hope we don't have to wait until oil, oil and coal run out before we tackle that. The speaker, Thomas Edison, the year, 1931, 1931. So my dear friends, the good news is we're actually finally catching up with Thomas Edison. <laughs> um, and let me give you some data on how we're doing that. In 2010, we had already achieved uh, a 20% and just over a 20% um, composition of renewable energy in the global uh, energy generation matrix. So already at 20% and climbing up. 2011, we hit the $1 trillion mark of investments globally in renewable energy. 2012, the renewable energy in, uh, industry created 1.5 new jobs, 1.5 million new jobs uh, in the new sectors of renewable energy. And those costs, as I'm sure you've all heard, the costs of renewable energy are decreasing. The efficiency of renewable energies is increasing, and that is opening up the possibility to investments that are surprising and that are occurring in surprising areas and surprising geographical regions. 
We just finished in the Climate Convention a conference of the parties, which is our big uh, yearly um, negotiation session in Qatar, in Doha, Qatar. Well, I will have you know that Qatar has already invested 1.8 gigawatts. They already have the investment corresponding to 1.8 gigawatts of solar energy because they understand that in the future, they need to capture the sun's energy in order to desalinate. Qatar doesn't have any fresh water. They desalinate all of their water. And they understand that it is the sun that is going to allow them to continue desalinating. Neighboring country, United Arab Emirates, has just a few weeks ago inaugurated a 100 megawatt concentrated solar power plant that is uh, the largest concentrated solar power plant in the world uh, and are continuing to invest in research and development. How are they going to adapt the different solar technologies to the very, very particular uh, conditions of the desert? You may think the desert is the worst thing for solar energy. It isn't because of all of the dust and sand. So they have to adapt that technology uh, for the desert, but they are doing so. And Saudi Arabia, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, has already on its investment plan $100 billion into also solar energy. Now, you ask me, why are all these countries that are actually at the heart of the fossil fuel production and exporting industry of the world, why are they putting all of this effort and funding into renewable energy? Uh, for the very simple reason that they understand that this is the way we're moving, that we're moving toward a low, low carbon economy, and because they want to remain competitive. So they are recreating themselves not as a fossil fuel exporting country, but as an energy producing and exporting country. So the conflicts about fuels, the, con the conflicts about which fuels we're going to use, that is also over. The question is no longer why are we looking at renewable energies, the question now is how fast are we going to get there and who is going to get there first. The third conflict that I want to share with you is the conflict of responsibility. And I dare say that is probably one of the most divisive conflicts in the climate, uh, in the climate uh, discussion. Because on the one hand, you have the question, well, who caused this to begin with? And the answer to that question is very clear. Incontrovertibly, it is the industri today's industrialized countries that have caused climate change on the basis of the industrialization that they have done on the back of fossil fuels over the past 100, countries, 100 years. So that is very clear. Then we have on the other side the other question, well, but where are emissions going to come from in the future? And the answer to that question is also very clear. The emissions of the future are going to come in particular from developing countries, but in particular from the large emerging economies, because they are the ones that are having the largest population growth. They're the ones that are, that are ready to go into very, very rapid economic growth. So if developing countries are not able to de-link their economic growth, which they have to pursue from the growth of greenhouse gases, i.e. From the, from the growth in use of fossil fuels, they will continue to emit. The challenge here is to de-link economic growth from the use of fossil fuels and the rise in greenhouse gas emissions. But you know, if we continue to be stuck in the question of, well, are you to be blamed for the past and are you to be blamed for the future? That is not going to get us very far. It does seem to me that there are two other questions that are much more helpful to ask. The first is, how do we support developing countries so that they can get the financing, the technology, the experience that they need to delink their growth? from the, uh, the increase in, in greenhouse gas emissions, because they do have to do this. And the second question 
that is actually very helpful is to look at responsibility not only from a past and future point of view, but from a collective point of view. And there, I hope you will agree with me, this is a collective responsibility. Independently of where you fall as a country in your emissions, no country is exempt. No sector, no human being is exempt from the responsibility of turning over this planet to the next generations. All of us share that collective responsibility without exception. The good news here is that we are actually on the path. I wouldn't claim that we have resolved this, but I do share with you that we are on the path of resolving this issue. Data. All industrialized countries, all, underlined, actually do have economy-wide emission reduction targets that they have already registered publicly. Are they ambitious enough? No. Are they a good starting point to where we have to go? Yes. And the important part of that is that all industrialized countries, including this one in which I was educated and you are living. In addition to that, despite the fact that developed countries have no historical responsibility and no legal responsibility under the Climate Convention, we have 56 developing countries that have actually already registered their intent as to what they're going to do in nationally appropriate mitigation actions to bring down their emissions by the year 2020. And I must say, it is perhaps uh, the three largest uh, em emerging countries, China, India, and Brazil, that are making huge strides in both the policy area of what, they're, what they are regulating in terms of renewables, energy efficiency, and in the case of Brazil on deforestation, um, they are really marking the trend. They are showing how this can actually be done. Are they doing enough? No. No country is doing enough. Is it the path we have to follow and increase? Yes. And just not to leave the little ones out, because I come from a little country, let me just share with you that uh, a few weeks ago, uh, I was in the Pacific, in the South Pacific, and I was hugely impressed that Tukalau, you know how big Tukalau is? <laughs> Tukalau has actually d realized they cannot continue to use a huge percentage of their GDP to import fossil fuel. All of those Pacific islands are paying two to three times what you and I pay for fossil fuels because of the transportation costs. So they have finally decided we're not doing this anymore. They have gone to 100% renewables. That is the first Pacific island that has gone to 100% renewables. Now you can say, OK, it's a tiny country. It's easy to do. But it's showing the example. And for Tugalau, it's a huge effort. So my good friends, we are walking down the path not to the scale, not to the speed that we need to, but we're walking in the right direction. Now, just to accelerate a little bit more and put my foot on the gas pedal, as I like to do, uh, let me share with you uh, what strides we're actually already making, not on a global and country by country, but from a sector point of view, because I think it'll give you a sense uh, of what we have now and where we can go. I'm going to talk to you about the strides that we're making in transportation, in energy, and in the building sector. Let me start with transportation. As we resolve the conflict of belief in science, we are making huge strides in the transportation sector. You know that electric vehicles are more and more in demand. And I just came from California uh, last week, and I was bowled over by the number of either hybrid or electric vehicles that are already on the streets. But to come to the East Coast, Tesla, have you ever ridden a Tesla? I rode a Tesla for the first time. Oh my god, it's like stepping into the future. It is so exciting. And the future is here. That is the cool thing. So Tesla is actually installing supercharging station that is going to stations that is going to make it possible to drive a fully electric vehicle from Boston all the way down to DC. All the way down to DC. New York, Mayor Bloomberg 
has already announced that by the year 2019, 20% 20 of all parking places in New York City will have individual charging stations because that is the demand that he is expecting there. And airlines, every single airline in the world is taking a look at their takeoff, flight, and landing practices and bringing down their, uh, and if, making their, um, their uh, flight practices much more efficient so that they don't have to use that much more fuel. Why? Because they all need to bring down their fuel costs, but at the same time, they're contributing to climate change. Now, those are what I call incremental changes, okay? Now, think of a world transformed, which is the world that we all want. Think of not just electric cars, think of driverless cars that communicate with each other in order to optimize the route that they use and the fuel that they use. Already here. Think of electric cars that no longer use any kind of fuel in the, strict, in the strict sense, but that actually are charged by the very driving on roads that are prepared with inductive power transfer. Think of algae being grown on any surface in order to produce the biofuels that are necessary for airlines and for maritime transportation. That is the world that we need. That is the world that we want. Energy. As we solve the conflict on fuels, we open up space for transformation in the energy sector. Now, I've given you a couple of data of what has happened worldwide. Let me give you a couple of data points on what's happening in the United States. Last year, the United States added 3.3 gigawatts of solar energy, which is more than the sum total that it had done over the past three years. It also added 13 gigawatts of wind energy. The sum total of what the United States added in solar and wind represents, in 2012, 49% of all new energy generation in the United States. 49% in one year. Not bad for a country that says it doesn't believe in climate change. Reggie, here on the East Coast, beating last year's uh, reduction target uh, and tightening the cap for next year and already in conversations with a linking system with the California cap and trade system in order to provide fungibility and bring down costs. So not bad for a start. I would put all of that into my incremental box. Now think of a world transformed. Think of every single surface, every single surface that you see, the roofs, the, the walls of buildings, parking lots, the roofs of shopping malls. Think of every single surface as a power generation plant because we are going to get there. Every single surface will be able to produce energy. Think of our waste. How much waste do we put out every week? Well, think of all our waste being either 100% recycled or transformed back into energy, because originally it came from energy. And think of a society that doesn't have any waste, that doesn't have any waste management challenges, because it has either recycled or it has returned the waste into its original energy. Think, if you will, of a world in which the 1.2 billion people who have no electricity today, 1.2 billion people have no electricity. Think of a world in which those 1.2 billion people have power, not from fossil fuels, but from little mini grids based on solar, based on wind, or even their own little power plant up on their roof, their own little solar panel. Think of the productive capacity of 1.2 billion people being brought out of poverty through the use of energy and becoming 
very productive citizens in their countries. That is a world transformed. The building sector. Well, we know that uh, there is an increased demand for green buildings uh, and that these green buildings that we have now already have lead lighting and they have, some of them even have smart thermostats that actually learn energy use patterns um, and allow you to bring down your electricity bill. Um, but now let's think of the building sector in a world transformed. 70% of emissions in the world come from cities and growing as there is more and more urbanization. So now think of cities that actually are full of structures that are not there passively, but actually learning structures. We were, we're gonna have not only learning institutions, but we're gonna have learning structures because the structures are going to be able to learn how the energy is being used in that structure and how the energy is being produced by that structure. Think of all of the facades being solar facades. Think of them growing algae. Think of the structures of the new cities collecting water from any precipitation that there is in order to irrigate the food that the buildings are gonna produce. So no longer will we have buildings where we have to bring electricity through these completely old fashioned wires that we have here, or bring food into the buildings. We're going to be having buildings that are completely independent, that are gonna be producing all the energy that they need, and they're gonna be producing most of the food that they need. Think of cities actually as not being built, but as being planted, because they will be living organisms. Think of cities, or at least parts of cities, as floating cities, because it gives them so much more resilience to sea level rise and to flooding. That is a world transformed. That is the world that we want to live in. So as we resolve our conflicts, you see the space that we're creating for ourselves. All of the technologies that I have talk to you about are either already here or they are just around the corner because we are moving all of these technologies from science fiction to science fact and we are doing that because it makes business sense that's why we're doing it and that is the most compelling motivation to actually advance along this um, along this <coughs> Of course, it also makes long-term economic sense because is it the only way that our growth is gonna be sustainable in the future? So friends, let me conclude by saying, yes, it is very true and I am happy to talk to you about the challenges of climate. Yes, climate change is a wicked problem. Completely accepted. But you know what? It also brings wicked opportunities. And it gives us, as humanity, the very important opportunity to learn how to resolve our conflicts through international collaboration. How to call upon the better angels of our nature, to quote Abraham Lincoln. You know, we have the capital. We have the technologies. What we need is the clarity of vision, the strength of will, and the power of optimism. Those are the better angels of our nature. And yes, you can gladly accuse me of being an optimist, no problem, rightfully so. But here is my message. Optimism is based on rigorous analysis, but is fueled by moral choice. And each one of us, each one of us, has the obligation to step up to that moral choice. Thank you. Questions, comments?
Sorry, my name is Ana Maria Frankic. I'm uh, also here, faculty at UMass Boston, and uh, I'm a biomimicry fellow. This is exactly what I'm teaching, the solutions and optimism and everything. So thank you so much for inspiring talk and the showing that there is technology, there is a solution, we just have to put our powers together. So how would you um, inspire universities like UMass Boston to become a leader in showcasing those types of technologies, becoming a, almost like a solution expo of everything that actually exists and sharing it with, improving it, applying it, and sharing it with our local communities? Um, well, I, I was actually asked a very similar question over lunch, and um, my, my answer to that is um, you are already doing a lot. UMass is already doing a lot because you're already, what's the data, 28% under, under, um, under 1990 um, levels. Um, and that's very important because you can't, you can't just talk the talk, okay? You have here, you have here the huge responsibility of influencing the minds of the future leaders. And as I was just saying at lunch, there's the, the window of influence is closing very, very quickly, right? I mean, I could influence my daughters when they were six and even when they were 16, but the, by the time they're 26, parents' influence is zero. It is now in your good hands. And this, the most important thing that you can do is influence with facts, with facts, influence the attitude that students leave with. They have to leave these halls with an attitude of, yes, we can solve this. That's number one. Number two, you can't just talk the talk, you have to walk the talk, so you have to show it. And you have to show how do you bring down emissions in a responsible way without it being a huge burden. Without it being a huge burden, it is doable. And number three, you can definitely be in touch with the other universities, with your other campuses, with other universities, and I know there are some of you from other universities, to encourage all universities to actually move forward. If there is a sector to which people look, is to universities, to academic institutions, because those are the seeds of the future. And if the seeds of the future are not behaving like the future, we have a problem. Right here. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I wonder if you could say something, something. Can you introduce yourself? My name's Amy Grunder. I actually used to be a student here. <laughs> um, I'm, I wonder if you could say something about the role of the private sector um, in addressing climate change. I, I do some radio work, and I recently um, interviewed Michael Clare, who you may know as a professor. I, uh, he's a professor at Hampshire College. I believe it's Peace and Security Studies. And he wrote a book called Extreme Energy. I forget the subtitle. Uh, and he was talking about the race um, for exploiting ever more technologically risky and harder to extract forms of hydrocarbons. And he was talking specifically about the development of oil sands, the tar sands in Alberta, Canada. He was talking about um, hydraulic fracturing, which is a growth industry in the United States, uh, for sure. He was talking about um, Arctic oil exploration as the and, and looking for more exploration as the ice caps melt and it becomes more less dangerous, supposedly, um, to have exploration there, and also um, deep water. Oil, drilling for oil. And what he described is, as, as kind of a global energy race to exploit the last of the Earth's hydrocarbon resources. So in light of that context, I wonder, um, it, it's, it's hard not to have um, be pessimistic, actually, about the role of the private sector. So I wonder if you could say something about that and maybe give me some hopeful news. <laughs> Thanks. Happily. There is the private sector and there is the private sector. There is no such thing as one private sector, right? Because 
all companies are actually vested in whatever their industry is. So please let it not come as any surprise that the oil and gas industry is vested in oil and gas exploration. I mean, that, that, that's what they've been doing. That's what they know how to do. They're going to continue doing that. Um, at the same time, uh, there is a burgeoning private sector that is investing in all of the cutting edge, uh, cutting edge technologies that I have mentioned here, um, and that understand that this is the way of the future. What gives me a lot of hope is um, perhaps it hasn't filtered down to all the companies, some of them, yes, but governments, as I mentioned here, governments who have been used to investing all of their resources into fossil fuels and looking for the last vestiges of every single uh, drop of oil that is still there, they are realizing, no, this has got to change. And, and let's be realistic. It's not that we are going to be fossil fuel society. It's just, just not going to happen. We will continue to use some coal in particular if it is accompanied by carbon capture and storage because coal without carbon capture and storage is just way too contaminating. So coal that is contaminated with car car uh, carbon capture and storage will continue to have a role, a smaller role than it has now. And natural gas will actually be with us in a more important way than coal um, just because it is, a, it is a fuel that has particularities that are very difficult to replace and the cost of, uh, of natural gas is coming down. That does not mean that we're not going to increase in renewable energy and that does not mean that even those companies and governments that have been investing here are not investing over here also. We're just going to have a different mix than what we have now. And if there's anybody that stands to gain, it's the private sector. So they are, as I said, we already have a trillion dollars invested. Um, and the latest report that I saw yesterday predicts a 320 increase, 320 percent increase in investment in renewables over the next few years. So it's a combination of a couple of things. It's a combination of policy, international policy, national policy to give the market signal of where are we going, we're going toward a low carbon world. And it's also a combination of the efficiency and the viability of renewables that is actually every day increasing. So just in solar, we have had a 65% decrease in cost over the past two years, just in solar. Um, and that is going to continue. So if renewable energies are going to be more and more cost competitive. In fact, they're already at grid parity in many countries of the world. Um, and the other, the fossil fuels, are going to increase in cost because they are looking for the last drop of oil. And it is very, very expensive. I spent some time in Saudi Arabia. I spent time in those oil fields. I know how they are increasing their costs in order to extract that. So there is a balancing act here, and we're sort of on the teetering point. Um, but we are moving toward renewables with the private sector. Please. My name is Amy Tai. I also was a student here a couple of years ago, maybe a couple of decades ago. Um, I've been doing some citizen lobbying group uh, a action, and we've been talking to local legislators, and they say to us, lo at local and state legislators, and they say to us, we're totally on board with what you're talking about, but it's the person on the street that doesn't have a clue that they're worried about jobs. So how do we address that? I mean, I hear what you're talking about with sectors and governments, but how do we address that the population you know, on the street at the local level? Mary Smith and Joe Blow. Yeah, no, that, that really is one of our major challenges. You know, how do, how do we talk about all the, I always ask myself, how do I talk about climate change without saying the word climate change? Um, because it is, um, that, that is the challenge. How do you put a human face to climate change? How do you make it relevant for Mary Smith walking down the street? Um, and, and that is a huge challenge. And, and I must say, I don't think that we in the Secretariat do a good job. Um, and, and I'm bound and determined to improve the communication of uh, uh, our communication this year and in the, in the lead up. Um, but I think, as you say, a lot of it has to do with um, immediate opportunities. So which, which sectors are creating more jobs um, than any other sector? Well, it's the renewable energy sector. I mean, just in the United States, there are more people enjoy and employed in the renewable energy sector than there are in the coal mining sector. 
So, and which one is growing? The renewable energy sector in terms of job creation. Um, so when, when we look at stability, when we look at economic growth, we have to understand that we are here, you know, on, on the cusp of a transformation and um, that those who want to have the security really need to be there. I would not recommend, I have two girls, I would not recommend either of my children or anybody under the age of 30 to go into a fossil fuel related industry because it is the industry of the past. It is going to be there, but it is not going to experience growth. It's not the cutting edge. If you're going to be in an industry, do go into all of the killing technologies and energy is not the next one. But that's, that is the future. That is the future. Hands up, yes. Hi, I'm Christine Brenner, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how um, the UN is working to overcome the hegemonic of the North versus the global South, and how the UN is working to tap the knowledge of indigenous persons in relation to uh, their deep knowledge about climate change. Well, first, I will suggest that um, the global north and the global south don't exist anymore because um, we have so much more of a complex economic system. Um, you know, what do you call China? Do you call it a developing country? Yes, if you look at poverty levels. Do you call it a developed country? Um, because of their financial status right now compared to the US. Um, you know, it just depends on what prism you look through. Um, so I'm not sure that it's as easy as it was 30 years ago um, or at the end of the Second World War to actually say, okay, this is the North, this is the South. It just doesn't exist anymore. Um, and that's actually a good thing because what it means is that the conversation needs to be much more sensitive, both to all of the differences that there are now are among the countries, but also to the common ground. And so what the UN does, what we are focused on, is finding that common ground among so many different countries. So, you know, you will imagine that Saudi Arabia has some interests that are not exactly the same as the 42 countries that are small island states in the climate perspective. Um, and it is our job not to bolster one or the other, but actually to find, to help them find common ground where they can actually move together. Because there's no such thing as solving climate out of you know, a few countries' solution. Everybody needs to be at the table. And when I say everybody, it's 193 countries without losing a one, without losing a one and they all need to march forward together. So that's what makes it very, very complicated. But actually also, I would be so bored if this were not complicated. <laughs> but sorry, what was your second question? What does the UN do and then? Oh, indigenous knowledge. You know, the area in which um, that is um, moving, and we're clearly not where we want to be, but the area in which that is being open, that space is being open, is everything to do with forestry policy, because that is very, very clearly where um, indigenous people, in particular in developing countries, um, can really contribute, because most, they are very, very, it, it, to a great extent, not in the United States, but in most countries, to a great extent, um, it is the forest from which they live and they understand and they see climate change in the forest every single day. And so their knowledge is one that is actually being tapped um, in all of the policies that are being developed around forestry and land use. And every year I see more and more indigenous people uh, participating at these international um, conferences. So it's actually exciting. Yes, a Twitter question or something like that. Hi. <laughs> Hi, we have somebody following at home on Twitter, um, Jamie Hagan, who asks, um, can we consider the role of gender justice in facing climate change? 
a very important topic, um, and one that I actually feel quite strongly about. Um, and, and I don't call it gender justice, I actually call, call it gender opportunity. Um, be, because of the following, because it is very clear um, that in particular in developing countries, it is the women who are um, facing the brunt of climate change. I very often say climate change has a woman's face. Um, because it is the women in developing countries who are responsible for food, water, and energy, because they're the ones that need to get the fuels for cooking. They need to go walk two or three hours to go get the water. They need to walk two or three hours um, to go harvest the food, plant and harvest. And that nexus of food, water, and energy is precisely the nexus that is being most affected by climate. Conversely, it is women who have an extraordinary opportunity to actually contribute to the solution. So a little tidbit for you. 50% of us women, there are, you know, there are, I don't know, this hall is probably a little bit more, more women than men, but 50% of all women in the world still cook on open fires. That should be immoral. It is immoral. It's not possible that in this century we're still having 50% of women Cooking on open fires, open fires, please picture it, okay? Three stones, three pieces of firewood, pot. Children crawling all over the floor. Women standing on top of those pots, breathing all this you know, wonderful pollution into their lungs. Children also, respiratory problems. Children getting their, their fingers burned. This is not something that we can live with. So, and it is the women who can change this, so we have an inordinate amount of um, projects around the world that are actually using the financial mechanisms that are created by the Climate Change Convention to change that and to bring highly efficient cooking, cooking stoves to all of these, um, all of these women um, in the different countries in, um, in the developing world and are doing that by getting the women involved in how do you put together these stoves, how do you maintain them, how do you, um, how do you make sure that you get the most cooking ability out of them, and what is that doing that is freeing up a lot of time of women who now don't have to go all the way, you know, several hours to get their firewood and be raped along the way. Um, so it's, it's very, very important to actually allow these women to bring those transformations um, into, their, into their experience. Another, an, another fantastic, um, fantastic um, initiative is an initiative that is teaching women in Bangladesh who, have, who currently are um, raising chickens to actually move from chickens to ducks. Do you know why? Because of the flooding, okay? So the flooding in Bangladesh has become now so frequent that the women who have been raising chickens for their own families and to sell are losing all the chickens. But if they move to ducks, guess what? <laughs> no, I mean, it's fantastic, right? And who came up with this? Of course, a woman. I mean, this is the point. You have to use women as agents of change. They are the ones that are most affected. They're the ones that see the chickens die. The men are gone. They come home and go, where's my dinner, right? And the woman says, well, the chicken died because of the floods. Well, this is the point. How do you get these tools into women's hands so that they can actually be the agents of change that they can be? Do we have a male asking a question? We've had very few males asking. Speaking about gender justice, let us do justice to the males in the room. Please. Hello, uh, my name is Uttam Sresta, and I'm a graduate student uh, here at U UMass, and I'm from Nepal, uh, the country which has already low in uh, different developmental index. Uh, as today, I read a news that develop uh, the aid agencies like DFID, they are switching their priority of their developmental aid, which is supposed to use in health and education into the climate change action funds. So how do you view the conflict of interest between these, uh, the funds uh, which is supposed to use in health and education and uh, the climate change action. So what could be the uh, solution to build this uh, 
uh, coexistence between these two sides, although they are a little bit interconnected each other. Thank you. Well, I would pose that they're not a little bit interconnected. I would pose that they are joined at the hip. Um, and I would ask you the question, which health policy is not affected by climate change? Very difficult. Uh, so I am not, I'm not one that says, OK, here we have climate change funds, and here we have development. You call it whatever you will, you know, health, housing, infrastructure, whatever you will. There is no such thing. What we need to do is keep our development funding and mainstream understand, look at development through climate eyes. How is the health challenge in Nepal going to be further exacerbated by climate? And what do I do about that? Because you cannot continue doing development as though climate didn't exist. Because it, it does exist, and it is already there. And I guarantee that there are health impacts on Nepal because of climate change. So you can't separate those two things. And whatever you call it, you know, I mean, so, so they call it because they have to, you know, report here and report there. That's not the point. The point is what are they actually doing? And when you get down to the ground, when you get really down to the ground, that's not the way the people are working. People are saying, okay, this is my health challenge. And now that I understand what the health, what the climate exacerbating factors are, here's how I'm going to change my health project. And the same thing for infrastructure, the same thing for education. So that's the way we have to actually integrate, not separate those two things, because that is a completely artificial, if you will, academic separation that is no help. One last question. Please. Yes, you. Actually, it was the one in the back, but go ahead. Uh, hi, I'm, my name is Fahim Sinha. I'm a freshman undergrad at UMass Boston. Um, my question was focusing on education. Um, just, you know, in middle school, I, my humanities teacher gave me an article on the desertification of the Gobi Desert, how it was, you know, by year by year, I forget the actual number that it was increasing, but the nearby towns were being eaten up and agriculture was steadily declining. Um, flash forward my senior year of high school, um, there wasn't a sense of, I felt like there wasn't a sense of, you know, all of these issues, environmentally, you know, tagged or otherwise, that, that wasn't, you know, addressed as such, that it wasn't a global issue. And one thing that um, a professor who was a neighbor of mine was saying, part of the problem of our education is that we don't have the sense of interdisciplinary focus where each issue, you, we, you just cited health, but is not put into our middle school or high school system. By the time we get to college, you know, it's really, there could be a tunnel vision in which we look at certain issues and say, well, I want to get into foreign policy, but I'm looking only at the political lens only, and everything else is, you know, I, I don't have the time to deal with that. So I'm wondering, from your agency, you know, how are you using maybe the United Nations Foundation or otherwise to get down to the, you know, different levels of public or private education and say, listen, we have to look at, you know, the, connecting the dots here. You know, I'm, I'm very glad that you brought that up because actually that's one of the things that, one of the many things that keeps me up at night because it is not just a problem of education, it's a problem of the UN. It's a problem of all development initiatives, all development agencies that they all do this thing, right? They all categorize, okay? Okay, here I'm gonna look at health, here I'm gonna look at it. And it's understandable because somehow you have to get the skill set that is particular and germane to the, the solving of the problem that we're looking at. But if you stand back, you can see that all of these things are completely interrelated. And I, I think that one of the challenges that the next generation is going to have, of which you are a shining example, is to figure out how are we going to integrate this? Because this silo thinking and this silo, you know, the pretense that by attacking these problems in silo fashion is actually going to get us forward is not going to happen. But that's the way that we have been structured. It comes even from, you know, all the way from the educational system. So I, I very much appreciate that you have brought that up. I don't have the answer, but I do know that it's got to be attacked. 
and that it has to be at all levels, starting from education all the way into how governments are structured, how governance is conceived, um, and certainly how the UN attacks problems, but also how each of the governments attack problems. Uh, so, you know, I, w I wouldn't want to solve that problem for you because we've got to leave something for the next generation. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Madam Secretary. If, uh, if global warming is a wicked problem, then uh, you delivered one wicked speech. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. Uh, our provost, uh, Winston Langley, said that you are a new kind of special leader. And um, I think we would all agree with his assessment. And we've been blessed here at the McCormick Graduate School, where I'm the dean here at UMass Boston, with a number of fantastic and inspiring women leaders this month. Um, and I want to thank you for being uh, the most recent. It, it started off with a woman named Miyaza Ashanafi, who is the founder of a women's bank, the only women's bank in Ethiopia or anywhere in the world. Uh, it included Madeleine Kunin, the former three-time governor of Vermont, who has a new book out called The New Feminist Agenda. It included uh, Betty Tamor and Elizabeth Sherman, the founders of our Center for Women, Politics, and Public Policy here at the McCormick School some 42 years ago. It included uh, last night Shelley Metzenbaum, who's the number two person in our Federal Office of Management and Budget and our Chief Performance Officer for the United States of America, who gave an inspiring talk about democracy and results-driven government, and Maggie Hassan, the governor of New Hampshire, uh, who is not only the second woman to be elected governor of New Hampshire, but the only uh, woman governor of a state that has an all-women congressional delegation, both U.S. <laughs> senators and both U.S. members of Congress. So you and others have blessed us with uh, inspiring leadership, and it's been a very moving month as your remarks indicated at the outset, and we appreciate your sensitivity uh, for all of us here in Boston. I want to take a, just a moment to not only thank you again, Madam Secretary, for taking time out of your incredibly busy global schedule to be with us and to share your wisdom with us, but to thank uh, Professor Maria Ivanova for delivering you. and. Uh, for Eben Weitzman, uh, the chairman of our Department of Conflict Resolution, Human Security, and Global Governance, for providing consistent leadership uh, across so many different dimensions. Just yesterday, you talk about wicked problems. There are a few issues that confront young people in the Middle East, and Eben and David Matz and their colleagues brought to our campus yesterday a group of 16 Arab Israelis, Arab um, Palestinians, and Jewish Israelis, 16 remarkable young people who might otherwise be killing one another or being killed by one another. Uh, they, they, they came here uh, as a gang for peace, playing the game of ultimate frisbee, which I learned has no referees. And they call their game ultimate peace. And across those three languages and all of those divides, in English, in Hebrew, and in Arabic, they are resolving their differences and showing us the way to a better world. So thank you for joining us uh, today at the McCormick Graduate School of Policy and Global Studies here at the University of Massachusetts. This is what we view as our mission. And thank you so much, Madam Secretary, for blessing us with your wisdom.